we can be the difference. We have enough uh, voters in Pennsylvania uh, that are AAPIs that if every one of us cast a ballot, we would be the deciding margin. Okay. So it's, it's an empowering message. And I completely reject the notion that a single voter's uh, vote doesn't matter because our elections are uh, won and lost um, by the slimmest of margins. Hi everyone, welcome back to The Situation Room, a journey into Asian America. We dive deep into the issues in the Asian American community from questions like, where are you really from? And representation to sharing food and our own experiences. My name is Emily Villaverde. And I'm Zach King. This episode, we invite KU into the Situation Room. Kay has a long career of civic engagement, uh, but she currently serves as the Voter Protection Director for the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. In this second segment, a uh, quick note, we uh, talk about how to vote, but that information is mostly targeted towards Pennsylvania voters. So if you're not a Pennsylvania voter, uh, make sure you check out IWillVote.com to learn more information. The whole theme of this episode with the November 3rd election coming up uh, for 2020 is voting. And so we are so excited to have Kay. She was an awesome guest. Emily, let's get into current events. Yes. So we mentioned it last week. Uh, it's the start of the Mid-Autumn Moon Festival. So lantern festivals, moon cakes, all of that fun stuff. But it's also the beginning of October, which is Filipino American History Month. So Filipino American History Month, or FAM, for our listeners that don't know what this is, this is the entire month of October and we showcase Filipino American culture and history of the Philippines. And I'm really excited for this month because, you know, I'm just looking around uh, social media and I'm seeing different schools do so many different things to showcase Filipino culture uh, to their communities through events like dance workshops and information sessions, general body meetings, all of that fun stuff. I know our university is doing a lot for FAM and I'm just really excited. Um, but yeah, that's that's fam. That's because you're the president. <laughs> yeah, I'm biased. I'm a little biased. Oh <laughs> uh, no, I'm excited for fam too. I love to learn new things. I mean, I I never quite understood like uh, Filipino culture um, until like meeting UM and like learning so much has been a lot of fun and you know learning more about like American history and Asian American history, especially like Filipinos have played an integral role uh, mm -hmm. in our country, and I love that. Um, but on that topic. Uh, Congresswoman Grace Meng has introduced a bill uh, to ensure students learn Asian American history, H.R. 8519, excuse me. Uh, to quote her, she says, for decades, our children's social studies textbooks have misrepresented or excluded the history of Asian Pacific Americans. Our children are graduating from high school without learning of the important contributions of the Asian Pacific American community has made throughout our nation's history. They are also graduating without learning of the disenfranchisement and discrimination Asian Pacific Americans have faced at the hands of the United States government. This is uh, an incredible bill. And I think it's really important because it, it ties into you know, part of our mission statement because the goal uh, of creating the situation room was to you know, spread uh, knowledge and information about the different you know, issues uh, and part of the you know, Asian American history uh, that the mm -hmm. API community have, you know, has. Yeah, and you know, when you first introduced this piece of current events uh, to me earlier, Zach, the first thing that I thought about was the University of Maryland College Park because this university actually has a department for Asian American studies. So they give their students the options to either major or minor in Asian American studies and further their education of the AAPI community through different courses taught at that university. And I thought that that was really cool because not just University of Maryland, but I'm sure there are many other schools around the United States that offer, you know, history courses and you know, ethnic courses just on the Asian Americans, you know, journey and mm -hmm. our history, which is really, really interesting. Yeah, I know a lot of schools on like the West Coast do it, like high school yeah. and, and colleges. But what's important is like, I think this should be mandatory because like, it's, I believe it's very difficult to understand like the issues of today without 
understanding like our history. And a big part of that is what we, you know, very underestimate um, is, you know, what roles Asian Americans have played. Like even, I don't know if you're familiar, like citizenship and birth rate citizenship. Mm-hmm. Um, but that it was decided by, I think, Wong Kim Ark, um, that that case uh, versus, I don't remember who was against, but, uh, you know, that Supreme Court case, you know, decided uh, that I think the 14th Amendment guaranteed birthright citizenship. If I'm being, you got to fact check me on that. I'll include a link yeah. in the show notes. Um, but I think also uh, on that topic as well, uh, speaking of like ethnic studies classes and universities, our guest, KU, I think she, if I'm not mistaken, I'll also have to fact check myself, <laughs> studied East Asian studies at Columbia. Um, I'm sad that we don't have a, a program like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. But that's the whole point of hosting, you know, this podcast and tuning into other podcasts that showcase Asian American culture because it's a continuous learning process. Exactly. Um, yeah. And while we're sharing everything that we learn from you guys, we're also taking in information and we're expanding our knowledge on the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Yeah. That's why it's a journey into Asian America. Did yes. you ever learn about Asian American history in uh, high school? No, actually. So I was very out of touch with my Asian American identity and my Filipino identity, you know, growing up. I really didn't connect with it until uh, I came to college as a freshman and I stumbled across the Asian American Students Association and the Filipino Students Association. I'm sorry. Um, But yeah, before then, I never really learned about, you know, Asian American studies, Asian American history until until fam uh filipino american history month was the first time that i really started learning about my culture's history and you know how we became what we are today Mm -hmm. so i think it's incredibly important for younger generations to not just learn about history but get a um, Mm well-rounded education on our history as a nation and not just like american history but like all aspects of it yeah no, I, I definitely agree. I mean, like in high, my high school and like public school system, there, I, I remember like a singular page on like uh, Chinese immigrants and like the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, and we very minorly learned about Japanese internment or, you know, American concentration camps. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember there, there were classes that you definitely went into it, but it wasn't mandatory. So like, you know i it's tough because like again with the issues today like understanding like our border policies and the the attainment of Mm -hmm. of immigrants and you know people seeking asylum like you can very much compare that to you know the concentration camps we had for japanese americans um definitely yeah so that is the you know very important for us to know yes but guys hang tight coming up next we have our topic interview with ku Okay, guys, welcome back to the Situation Room. For this week, we have the amazing KU with us. Hi, Kay. We are so excited to have you here on our show. Why don't you start by telling us and our listeners at home a little about uh, yourself and your background just so that we can get to know you. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's it's really an honor and a privilege uh, to be here with you. So, hmm. Sometimes I describe myself as a formerly undocumented immigrant. Um, I was born in Seoul, Korea, um, and I came over to the United States when I was about three and a half. So if I were 30 years younger, (laughs) I would be um, a dreamer or a DACA kid. And the only difference between um, me and uh, the situation that young people are facing today is that I I found a path to citizenship um, through the Immigration Reform and Control Act that was passed in 1986 and signed into law by a president, Ronald Reagan. How times have changed. 
Wow. Um, and another question we have, I guess, is that you've been very active in you know, local and state government. Uh, you're very civically engaged. You were the chairperson uh, to the Commission of Human Relations in Philadelphia. Uh, you ran for judge of Court of Common Pleas. You chaired the Governor's Commission on Asian uh, Pacific American Affairs. There's, you have a, quite a resume um, that uh, we're really excited about. But you know, civic engagement, um, we can tell is very important to you. Uh, but historically in the AAPI community, hasn't our participation hasn't been as high uh, as we'd like it to be, you know, especially compared to our counterparts. Um, and so we're curious, like what motivates you to be so civically engaged? Mm. So I'm very proud to be um, civic minded and um, think about voting uh, not as a birthright because that's never something that I had, uh, but as much as uh, a responsibility as it is a privilege. And this was a long time in coming for me. When I was young um, and uh, about 10 years old, I found deportation notices for me and my entire family. And with that, you know, we really lived in the shadows, although. I have to say, times are so much more difficult, more terrifying for people who are undocumented as, as I was as a, a young person. Um, and that made me feel even more like an outsider, um, very, uh, someone who, who we, as we were living in the shadows, that I had no voice. And it made me feel that I had no say in it and therefore no responsibility for the government that we had. Um, I was, I, I had a lot of apathy back then. And I hope to be able to share my story with folks um, and folks like you in a way that I can like expedite the process of learning for others. <laughs> uh, something that took me uh, years, if not decades, to realize that for our democracy to work, every single one of us needs to be engaged, to care, to spend time, to be committed, to study what is happening, understand uh, what's on the ballot. And without all of us taking all those steps and making sure that we cast a ballot in a way that can be counted, that our democracy suffers. And in order for this to work, we all need to take that responsibility. I like that. So I feel like when we talk about undocumented immigrants, you know, we usually think of uh, people of Latinx descent in this, you know, in our environment today and our political climate. Um, and so I'm curious, like, do you think that the portion of people who you know have this undocumented experience uh, can relate to you and? Um, how important is it that you know we include Asian Americans in that narrative, and what can we do from here to make the situation better? As a you know, in part of uh, or in the context of uh, participating in democracy. Yeah. So, you know, let's take for example Philadelphia. Um, the reason that Philadelphia is growing in population and we're getting stronger as a city. Um, is because of the vibrant nature of the immigrant community. So um, Asian Americans, um, Pacific Islanders are the uh, fastest growing immigrant population uh, across the nation. And that really is why uh, Philadelphia is growing and thriving in that way. Um, and that is our experience as a nation. It's because of the entrepreneurship um, so much of what 
are the positive values of being an American and living the American dream is across all immigrant populations. And we should be in a place where we celebrate that and realize the economic impact that we have um, on, on a building in a positive way. Uh, and that's, I think, a very concrete, very substantive way to um, push back against the really hateful rhetoric that often is accompanied uh, with how uh, immigrants are treated, are um, talked about these days, uh, and, and stop um, pigeonholing folks into a particular narrative um, because you know, a lot of folks become undocumented, not because they enter or cross a border, uh, but because, uh, you know, they overstay after a visa expires. Um, and in fact, uh, sort of the largest population of um, folks who are undocumented are from like, uh, from Western Europe. So we should think about what the facts really are when we're talking about immigrants and, um, and just spend a little time uh, with the recognition of how powerful our um, voice is, both from an economic driver perspective, but also as um, uh, a percentage of the population that can affect real change in elections. Awesome, no, I, I like that answer. Yeah, okay, so a question that I have for UK is, you know, compared to other democracies, the United States isn't known for its high voter turnout. Um, and within our country, Asian American Pacific Islanders or AAPIs have historically had much lower turnout rates. But according to AAPIdata.com, Asian American voter turnout has been drastically increasing from 28% in 2014 to 42% in 2018. What are ways you think we can increase voter turnout, um, you know, in our AAPI community, but also how can we raise uh, voter turnout as an entire nation? Yeah, so... It is, that's a big question. <laughs> and we, well, take for example, what you're doing. This is what we need to be doing is having conversations like this. We need to empower all voters, but especially our AAPI um, uh, fellow uh, voters and I like to talk about how, you know, these days when all elections are decided on the margins, right? Let's take, for example, the fact that in 2016, um, the deciding margin in uh, Pennsylvania for the presidential election was 44,292 votes. That comes down to about five votes per precinct. Wow. So that's what we talk uh, about to everyone who is stepping up to um, protect voters in Pennsylvania um, as a poll observer or um, in, in all the other ways that we have available. Um, it's what we talk about when I speak to groups um, of young people, um, to groups of AAPIs, that um, since the margins are so slim, slim, we could make, we can be the difference. We have enough uh, voters in Pennsylvania uh, that are AAPIs, that if every one of us cast a ballot, we would be the deciding margin. Oh, so wow. it's, it's an empowering message. And I completely reject the notion that a single voter's 
uh, vote doesn't matter because our elections are uh, won and lost um, by the slimmest of margins. Wow. I, I've been noticing in some of the, the, the graphics and stuff, that, um, especially I know there's like a, a bigger uh, campaign t- targeting AAPIs uh, this election season. And a lot of it talks about how states uh, and swing states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, Michigan, how AAPIs are that margin um, that can make all the difference. And I think that's really fascinating. And I mean, during my lifetime, there's been a large emphasis on outreach to increase voter registration in, and turnout in the Black and Latinx communities. Uh, and I personally got to meet people from, I think, New Florida Majority, which works to increase, uh, increase the political power um, of Black and Brown communities, which is awesome, um, and down in South Florida. Uh, but something I've noticed in 2020 you know, compared to 2016, as I just mentioned, is like this greater emphasis on Asian Americans. Um, I'm curious, did you ever feel growing up that someone reached out to you and your community uh, to you know, participate and vote? I really did not feel that. I felt very excluded and shut out. I think that that um, was, you know, in conjunction with the fact that I was ineligible to vote, that um, it caused me to, um, to, to stay in the shadows, really. But after I became um, uh, a permanent resident, you know, um, I decided to go to law school. And I did that really as a result of the fact that I, um, in applying uh, to become a a permanent resident, and as I mentioned before, under the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which had um, a a legalization program, um, and then an additional grandfather clause, which said that I would be able to apply um, directly for permanent residency without going through the legalization uh, process that was um, enacted back in 1986. And, you know, after going to an immigration lawyer and asking him um, for his help, um, he told me about this grandfather provision, which I went to back, uh, this was when I was in college, I went back uh, to the law library and because I just, I didn't believe him that there was this magical clause that would allow me to apply directly for permanent residency. Um, But I looked it up and I went back to the lawyer and I said, um, you know, okay, now now I see the the language, um, but I'm really uh, worried about, um, you know, this thing being at the discretion of the attorney general. And he sort of laughed at me and he's like, well, if you can go look up the law, on your own and um, you know, come and ask these kinds of questions, then you can, you can do this by, on your own and do it by yourself. Um, so it was, I I've sometimes feel like I was my own first client because <laughs> it was um, going around to come up with evidence to show that I had lived in the United States continuously uh, since before 1972, right? Um, so, how do you prove that a three and a half year old had lived in the United States continuously for, you know, for the last, you know, 25 years? Um, and, you know, I gathered evidence, I put all that together and um, put my application in, which was, which was granted. And, you know, I was graduating college and thinking, well, what am, what am I going to, to do now? And having, um, Having looked at this federal statute that so uh, so much affected my life, I just I decided to to go to law school. So that was really the the turning point because I graduated law school in 1993, um, and that was the same year uh, that I uh, became a naturalized citizen. So I started voting very late in life. <laughs> and didn't fully appreciate it back then, what it meant. Um, But I had to fight so hard to get to a place where I had the right to vote that I I voted in every election that that I, after I became eligible. And 
like I said, it's taken me, you know, decades of my life to come to the, the realization that voting is the fundamental uh, building block for our democracy. And without that, we don't have a voice. And this I learned like over years and, and over time as I was practicing law and then became a public servant and understood how important it was to have these public works available for everyone in our nation, regardless of your citizenship. Um, and, and it just became a, a core value to me, which is what I am so um, appreciative of for the both of you for having me to talk about how, how we have to take our democracy as our own individual responsibility and knowing that um, we have strength in our numbers that we can absolutely make a difference. I love that answer. Um, and it actually segues into the question that I have for you. So especially with this election coming up, everyone or a lot of people understand the importance of getting your vote in. Um, but I wanted to ask you, why do you think it's important to, you know, encourage more people within the Asian American Pacific Islander community to vote? And more so, why do you think it's important to try and get more people from our community to participate uh, more in politics? If we aren't voting, if we aren't um, stepping up, if we weren't, aren't taking leadership roles um, and that putting ourselves on the line um, to participate in our government, uh, to be part of our government, um, we, we are lost. And mm -hmm. we, it, it, it's, we face different kinds of challenges. Um, we are so diverse. What it means to be Asian American Pacific Islander, um, it's, it's so, so many things, um, so many languages. And so many challenges to getting information about how government works, information about voting itself to our communities. And we have to step up to, to, to meet those challenges uh, because that is the only way that we can have a voice. We have to, we have to be the, the democracy that we want and we can't effectuate anything, any change for ourselves without taking that first step. Definitely. Um, yeah, I think it's really important uh, for everyone, not just everyone, but especially, you know, the smaller communities um, within the United States to really get out there because, you know, we, to, we don't really have that much of a voice to begin with, um, especially with everything that's been happening this year, 2020. Um, you know, it's, I think now more than ever, it's important to really just educate, educate yourself more and understand what's going on with our, with our government. Uh, so thank you for that answer. Guys, we are going to take a short, short break, but hang tight. We will be back with more questions for Kay. All right, welcome back into the Situation Room. Uh, we have KU, and so we're curious, Kay, as the Voter Protection Director for the Pennsylvania Democratic Party, what exactly does your job entail? Because it's a pretty cool title. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I spend every day protecting voters in Pennsylvania. It's really pretty simple. We want every Pennsylvanian who is eligible to vote to be able to cast their ballot and for their ballot to be counted. Pretty <laughs> simple to say. There are a lot of moving parts to it. <laughs> Can you are you allowed to tell us about like some of the moving parts to it? Well, first of all, I definitely want to tell everybody to make your plan to vote. 
And in Pennsylvania, yes. voting has already started. So there are three ways to vote in Pennsylvania, which is pretty much two more ways than the vast majority of voters had just a, a year ago. Um, so let me tell you about what the three ways are. Um, first, uh, people can go on election day, November 3rd, to vote at the polls. That, that we're used to, we've done that a lot. It, that was the way that pretty much everybody had to vote during that 13 hours during that Tuesday in November. But really excited that we have a uh, vote by mail for every eligible voter, so no excuse required. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we have voting early in person, uh, which is really brand new, never done before in the history of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And that's where voters can go to their county elections office, request a mail-in or absentee ballot, complete it right there, and hand it in. So that's the three ways that voters can vote now. Um, everyone should, you know, make a plan, uh, pick the method that is best for them, uh, fits into your schedule, is the most convenient for you, um, and then make a plan B and a plan C to make sure that uh, your vote is in and that it will be counted. Wow, I actually didn't know that last one. Neither did I. That's really interesting. It's, it sure is. Um, I live in Philadelphia. And right now there are seven offices open in Philadelphia where voters can go um, and do exactly what I said. Just go in, request a mail ballot. Um, they will make sure that you do everything that you need to complete it. That is, you know, you mark your ballot in blue or black ink and then put your ballot inside what's called a secrecy envelope. That's the envelope that's marked, you know, official election ballot on one side and is blank on the other. And you put your ballot inside of that to maintain the secrecy of who you're voting for. So seal the ballot inside the secrecy envelope and that all then goes inside what I call the return envelope. You can tell that it's the return envelope because it has the county elections office address on one side. And then on the flip side, there are two declarations, uh, one for the voter to fill out. And if the voter needs assistance um, in signing the, the ballot, then there is a, a witness um, uh, declaration. So just make sure that you complete the voter declaration um, if you don't need assistance in um, signing it, um, date it, uh, and, and then sign it. Don't forget to, to sign it. Um, and then you seal that up and that's a complete vote by mail package. And if you do it in person, that's the same kind of ballot that you will use and hand it right back on the spot. Awesome. So a question I have with vote by mail is like, there's a lot of misconceptions that people have. Um, can you tell us like some things to like kind of dispel those misconceptions and like, I don't know, make it really simple, I guess. Yeah, actually, it's so simple that I've already covered it. So it's, <laughs> That's true. You did. Yeah, yeah, that is the whole process. Yeah. So um, you just have to make sure that uh, you return your ballot with two envelopes, right? Mm -hmm. Use the secrecy envelope and then seal your ballot inside of that. And then the second envelope is the return envelope. Uh, sign, date, and uh, complete the voter declaration. And, and those are the things you need to remember you want to make sure that it is timely received. So if you're gonna mail it back, uh, make sure you leave plenty of time. And we really strongly recommend that uh, if you want to, to use the mail to send it back, um, put it in no later than like two weeks before the election. Um, but you can also just go to a county elections office and drop it off in person. Uh, sometimes there are multiple offices where you can go. And some counties are gonna have drop boxes. So you can go to a website. It's called iwillvote.com slash PA. And it, you can look up all of the locations uh, where you can go to vote early in person or to drop off your ballot that you received through the mail. Awesome. Awesome. So, okay. Oh, go ahead, Emily. Oh, sorry. Uh, do you have a, do you have a follow-up question, Zach? Well, I was just going to ask, like, 
because vote by mail you know is is very new to a lot of the country um what makes it you know pandemic aside uh, like a game changer for elections oh think about it uh, i've saying it before that if you vote at your polling location on election day you have to go to the right polling location for you because um, in Pennsylvania, you have to go to where your precinct is, is voting. And you have to do it within um, a 13 hour period of time. So there are many in our community who work, who run stores, who have their own businesses, who work shifts that cannot take time during that 13 hour period to go and exercise your constitutional right to vote. So what vote by mail, no excuse required um, provides uh, for everyone and particularly for our community is the flexibility to vote at a time that works for you. So this makes, this, this is really a game changer um, to our community to make voting accessible. Awesome. So I know that the most important um, way right now to get involved in politics is voting and making sure that you're out there casting your ballot for this election. But besides voting, what are other ways that people can participate? So this is something that, again, I had to learn over time. Voting isn't just an individual responsibility. It's really a group effort so that you can learn um, about what's on the ballot, make really informed decisions, and doing that work up front and researching the candidates, uh, looking at the ballot questions, should be a group activity. And the best way that we can engage our own people is to have those conversations. And that personal, um, the personal touch is what's going to motivate people. It's what's going to inspire people. Um, and that's one of the things that I valued the most about being a judicial candidate was the opportunity to talk about how we all need to do democracy better, um, to, to make particular outreach um, to my fellow AAPIs, um, to talk to them not just about my election and my race and my candidacy, but really showing how we need to take leadership roles and and take the 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 plunge and and it's an act of courage to to undertake something as big as a, a campaign um, but it really gave me an opportunity to let people know that we in that May 19, uh, May 2019 election were not only picking judges who have make life or death decisions over um, everyone who, who goes before uh, these judges, uh, but again, that you know, everybody who is running our city, everyone who runs our elections, those were the folks who were elected in, in that, um, in that cycle. And I think that the fact that I was talking to, to people really personally gave them a reason to think about it and, and engage more. And even though I didn't win, um, participating in democracy at that level was something that was really life altering for me. And I wanted to use it as a platform to help, you know, raise awareness and, and make folks in our communities feel, um, feel like there's a reason for me to reach out to folks that, 
was something that really I never felt happened for me. Mm -hmm. And to, to, it was really one voter at a time. <laughs> and it makes, it makes that much, it makes that much difference. Um, I, I'm very uh, proud and happy that I ran. Um, it felt very, very um, impactful at the time that I was doing it. And in retrospect, I'm really glad that I didn't win because I feel that there is nothing more important to do during this time in this election cycle as we get ready um, for the November election in 2020 where everything is at stake. Everything, our very democracy is on, um, on the ballot. And this is the time for every one of us to know that we have to turn out, we have to register. If you're in Pennsylvania, you have to register to vote. The deadline is October 19th. You don't have much time left. So make sure you go to iwillvote.com slash PA and, and register to vote. Um, also check your, your status. If you haven't, make sure you're active uh, because it's, it's, so, it's so important and we, c we will make the difference. Yeah, I, I love what you said. And I mean, I commend you for running for office. That takes a lot of guts. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And something else is like, it, oh, you're very right. <laughs> I don't know. I can't disagree with you. Um, I, I think it's really important. That one of the points you made is that you did never had someone reach out. And I think that that's changing a lot because as I mentioned earlier, like seeing some of the um, graphics and stuff like targeting a, a APIs and especially like young voters and young APIs um, and like how I knew that the Asian Americans were the margin difference because of that outreach like the fact that there is outreach uh, is incredible yes okay before we let you go Kay here in the situation room we ask everyone that we interview a set of questions so I'm going to start off with what do you think it means to be AAPI? It is everything to me. <laughs> it, it, it can be your definition. It doesn't have to be like the yeah. definition, just your own opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's it's such it's such an interesting question um, because I am a Korean American, and and folks can just by looking at me <laughs> tell that I am Asian. Um, it is something that throughout my entire life, people have felt entitled to approach me and ask me such things as, um, what are you? A lot of times it was a very confusing um, place to be. At this point, I think it's part of my superpower though. <laughs> And I don't know what it is, or I've never been outside of who I am, um, but it really does feel powerful to me to be able to bring our people together to move forward. I like that. I love that. <laughs> uh, I don't know that that like answers your question. No, fully, it's okay. It's an <laughs> no, opinion. No, that's perfect. To take. Everyone answers it differently. Everyone answers. That's why we ask it. Um, <laughs> but another question, much, I don't know. It's also a hard question, but, um, you know, it oh, requires some choosing. <laughs> uh, we try to ask because it's much more lighthearted and fun, but we're curious, what's your favorite Asian dish? Oh, kimchi. <laughs> 
(laughs) Seriously, that was my favorite food since I was a baby. So, yeah. I think you have the the (laughs) quickest answer because most people like have to like That was the fastest (laughs) time someone has ever answered this question because everyone's like, oh my goodness. And they, there are so many dishes that come to mind. I love that you just automatically knew. And I also love kimchi. (laughs) It's so good. But okay, next question. Um, There are a lot of people that have influenced you um, throughout your life, but who would you consider to be your AAPI role model? So that is definitely my mom. So she sacrificed everything so that I could live the American dream. And even though I now have been alive a lot longer without her than with her, she is the reason that I am who I am and that I do the work that I do. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Our last question and last and final question, how can people connect with you, learn more about you or uh, register to vote resources uh, that you're very passionate about? Yes, absolutely. So first of all, go to iwillvote.com slash PA so that you can make sure that you're registered. You can find uh, the voting early location that is near you. Um, You can find uh, your polling place that will be open on November 3rd when all of those decisions are finalized. And so go there. And if uh, you want to volunteer uh, with the voter protection team in Pennsylvania, you can go to joebiden.com slash protect polls. Amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you again to KU for joining us in the Situation Room. We really do appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with us and for being on our show, as well as for all the work that you've been doing so far. Um, Guys, if you are interested in anything that was mentioned during this interview, if you're interested in the resources that Kay has mentioned, definitely check out our website for the show notes uh, for this episode at www.situasianroom.com. But yes, thank you so much, Kay, for coming onto our show. It really does mean a lot. Thank you, Zach and Emily. It's been a privilege. everyone welcome back to dish it out so last week zach and i challenged each other to dive deeper into the asian american pacific islander community and look into different dishes from different cultures and different cuisines but this week we're gonna bring it back home and talk about some more of our favorite dishes from our own cultures like always i'll go first this week i'm gonna be talking about pancit which is philippine stir-fried noodles this is a staple dish to include in like you know what i call my filipino like cuisine starter pack meal when i'm trying to introduce my friends to filipino cuisine Um, it's a staple dish in the philippines it's so simple it's vermicelli um noodles or you know rice noodles and it's stir fried with chicken or shrimp or whatever you know protein you want to include and then lots of vegetables so some staples are carrots cabbage string beans my grandmother will sometimes put um she'll put all of that and then she'll also put mushrooms in it which not a lot of people have it with mushrooms but i personally like the the taste of the that the mushrooms add um but i personally i love pancit it's such a staple dish. Like you, everybody loves pancit. It's, I mean, because I've said it before, you can't go wrong with a noodle dish. It's so good. You can't um, go wrong. You can't. Have you tried pancit before, Zach? I have not. I had a million different stir fries, but not not pancit. Okay, you've been friends with me for way too long for you to not have tried all of these Filipino foods. So we need to I know. fix that. You're, sla- you're slacking. Um, excuse you. <laughs> Guys, I just want to state for the record that whenever we're at school and the Filipino Student Association that I'm with 
has food events, we usually always have Punsit. I'm always so it's not that. my fault. It's your fault for not pulling through. Okay. I was sick. I'm just going to say that. The time they had the feast, I was sick. And I had to miss a lot of stuff. And I was, I was upset because I was sent all the pictures of the food. And I was jealous. Oh, um, okay. But you definitely have to try Punsit. Um, I mean, right now we're stuck in quarantine. But one thing that I've been doing a lot recently is I've been trying to make, I've been trying to cook and learn new dishes. My grandmother, I love her, but there are a lot of dishes where I try and ask her for the recipes and she makes the excuses like, oh, I don't have a recipe. I just make it. Or she'll be like, why are you asking me for the recipe? I'll just make it for you. Oh. But yes, Bunset is one of the dishes that I have not learned from her yet, but I'm getting close to learning it. It's just, it's for me, it's comfort food. Growing up, my sister and I always had, you know, our go-to dish was Punsit with rice and, you know, barbecue, like bar- the barbecue, ske- like Filipino style barbecue skewers. Any Filipino party, that's usually what the kids are eating. <laughs> At like the little kitty table, I promise you every dish is the same. It's punsit, a little bit of rice, barbecue skewers, and lumpia. <laughs> it's simple. That's actually, honestly, that is my Filipino cuisine starter pack meal. Because <laughs> it's so delicious. good. Aww. It's it's the staples that you need to in- like when you're introducing someone to Filipino cuisine. Those are the staple food items that you need to show them. That. And then you go into dessert and you show them ube, but that's for, that's for dessert. But yeah, Punsit is so good. Zach, you need to try it as soon as you can. Once I, I learn how to make it, I'm going to make it for everybody. I'm, I'm down, I'm down. Uh, my dish that uh, is a childhood favorite of mine, um, you, usually you can order it at a dim sum restaurant, but you don't really see it on a cart. Uh, Peking pork. Have you ever had it, Em? They make Peking pork? It's not like Peking duck. It's it's different. I don't know why it's called Peking pork. Um, I was gonna but, ask: Is it prepared the same way as Peking duck? Because that's the only time that I've, you know, I've heard of it. I've only heard it made, you know, Peking duck. I've never yeah. heard of Peking pork before. I'm not sure what makes it Peking, but um, oh, excuse me. Cool. Um, Peking pork is so delicious. Uh, the way they usually do it is instead of being being like oven roasted like uh, peking duck it's usually fried um like kind of like a deep fry and so it's drenched in a crispy batter and then the sauce on top that's tossed in is like super it's like very it's sweet and it's red and usually that red comes from like food dye uh, mm. but it's with thin cuts of pork chop and sometimes topped with sesame seeds usually served over rice or well, when it's served you eat it over rice but like it's just comes in a massive pile um, and it's absolutely delicious because it's savory, it's sweet, it's crispy, um, it's never dry if prepared right. And you use the rice and the sauce drips on the rice and it's just beautiful. Wow. That sounds amazing. It's a, you said it's ser- usually served in dim sum? That's, yeah. Like usually like most dim sum restaurants, it's like made to order kind of thing. Oh, um, but a lot of like more authentic Chinese restaurants do it. But it, it's it's on the rarer side they're harder to find wow i definitely have to try that i've never heard of peking pork before that's so interesting um so good (laughs) yeah um you know that's the point of dish it out to share things we didn't know um and also things we love uh and so you know we can't just use our own um you know favorites we want to hear from you guys our audience so make sure to send us your recipes whether that's via social media or submitting on our website and we'll do our best to feature it on dish it out uh, whether that's you know on our blog or here in the dish it out podcast segment yes guys zach just mentioned the dish it out blog definitely check that out we post recipes that we talked about on the show as well as different recipes from you know friends and you know other people that want to showcase their own dishes and recipes uh and we also have little video clips of the dish it out segments on our on our website so definitely check that out but that wraps up dish it out for this week
Thank you again to KU for coming into the Situation Room, and thank you all for tuning into this episode. The Situation Room is produced by Crimson Planet Media. Make sure to check out our website, situationroom.com, for the show notes. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook at The Situation Room for more content. Yes, guys, we also have a newsletter. So don't forget to sign up on our website, that Zach just stated, to get exclusive content and updates with our show. Also, make sure you hit that thumbs up button, give us a like, subscribe to us on YouTube or wherever you tune into our show. And as always, we want to hear from you guys. So send us messages and recipes for Dish It Out through our website, slide into our DMs on Instagram, send us messages on Facebook, and let us know what you want us to talk about next in the Situ Asian Room. But for now, thank you again for joining us on this step of our journey through Asian America. Once again, my name is Emily Villaverde. And I'm Zach King. We doing this next week? Hell yeah. Same place? All right. Let's do it. On Zoom. Bye, guys. (laughs) Bye.